Hello and welcome to another video. So this is another video in the series where I'm going to be talking about more general aspects of game development. In this case, I'm going to be talking about in general how you can structure the development of your project from the very beginning to the very end of the project. So let's dive right on in. So where I want to kick off uh, is the kind of key things we're going to be having a look at. So the stuff I want to be able to be talking about is I want to talk about how we can actually go about coming up with our ideas, what's called ideation, how we can work out what it is we're going to actually make. We want to have a look at, okay, well, we've got lots of ideas. How do we polish that idea? How do we refine it? How do we work out what one we're actually going to make? Because we usually end up with more ideas than you know, one. We'll have several. So how do we navigate picking which one? We're going to have a look at how do we plan and structure in general our development there to make sure that we're getting things done consistently and that we're making sure we're able to be delivering things on time. We're going to be talking about how we can do our testing and gathering feedback. That's how we ensure that we're delivering something that is a more polished, higher quality project. And that's a really sort of key aspect there. And then we're going to talk about that final delivery stage, the, the bit where it's a case of like, cool, we need to bring this to a shippable level. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we can actually achieve doing that. So kicking off, ideation, coming up with ideas for our projects. So to do this, a starting point, if we don't already have prompts, we can, we can make ones ourselves. You know, every person on the team can pick a few different things. You can build from there. Uh, there's, you could find prompts for other game jams, stuff like of that. You could source a lot of different prompts from different locations. And those prompts could be a word, they could be a phrase, they could be an image, they could be, you know, a particular sound, things like of that. So they don't need to be, you know, one specific type of thing. You can have a range of different ones there. If you've got prompts or once you've generated your own prompts, then look into them. If it's a particular word, what does that word mean? So don't just look at, okay, the common understandings that you might have for that word. Look at all of the possible meanings of it. Look at, um, you know, and that in particular, finding those additional meanings can be really valuable for giving unique spins on something. So look into what the meanings are of a particular word. As you're doing that, ideas might come to mind. There might be ideas for a particular chunk of the game. There might be ideas for a, you know, a key moment or a mechanic, things like of that. Note those down. So as you're doing this, make sure you're noting everything down. You want to make sure you've got, got those there to then refer back to afterwards. And look for things where ideas overlap, or so some of the words overlap, or where they contradict. You can get some really interesting things out of prompts there that are very contradictory. Finding though then from those ideas, you'll have lots of stuff. How do you draw that together? Because you've got this big sort of sea of ideas that we need to start to pull together into sort of more concrete concepts. So general thing I recommend there, try and make something unique. Don't don't just say, you know, okay, if a particular prompt, I'm just going to read, you know, that fits this particular existing game. Let's just make a, an existing version of that. Let's just make a cut down version of it. It's always going to be hard doing something like of that to achieve anything that's going to feel more than just a, a sort of very you know, pale copy of it. And we want to, we can do better than that. We can do more interesting things than that, you know find interesting, unique twists on existing ideas. Uh, I think there's a lot of value there and a lot of interest for players in something where it's like, this looks on the surface like this type of game you're very, very familiar with, but there's some unique twists and changes and adjustments there to it that make it really compelling. So, you know, don't remake Doom. Don't remake something that's been done dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Like there are umpteen first person shooter style games out there. It's not to say that you can't make a good first person shooter, but 
to make a first person shooter that stands out these days is challenging. It can be done, it does get done, but it is not easy. Uh, even, you know, things like the remakes of Doom, there was all, some really key things that were done there that made them stand out and made them feel fresh and new. Uh, so that's something where it is, it is something where it's, it's a challenge. So don't just redo a bland, pale version of something that already exists. You know, if you took Doom and you're like, it's now a turn-based card game. That's interesting. That's something that, you know, like if you're like, here's another first person shooter, it's not really going to get a lot of attention. Be like, it's, it's this, but it's a turn-based card game or other you know, riffs like of that. That catches the attention. That gets people initially like, wait a minute, I haven't heard that thing before. I want to know more. And that's cool. Have something that's an interesting hook there for the game. As I was saying before, contradictory prompts can give you a really good inroad into that. That contradiction can become core mechanics of the game. So you can have two prompts that seem like, okay, how, how can I combine something that, you know, might be, okay, has to be super calm and chill and relaxing with, you know, high energy, heavy metal. How can you do that? It's like, there are, there are, there are things with, that you can do with stuff like of that. So look for interesting ways to combine stuff. Don't be afraid of things being like, well, that doesn't fit with this. It's like, oh no, maybe, but could it fit with it? How could you make it fit with it? Uh, is, is good stuff to be considering there with that. When you're, you know, working with the ideation, general stuff. Because there are a lot of different ways of approaching it. And there is, you know, ideation as an actual form or practice is something that you know, there's been quite a bit of study and research on. And that there are quite a lot of uh, techniques and things like of that that are out there that you can be using for this. So looking into those formal techniques is really valuable. Those are ways that you can then help guide and shape that process so that you can generate better ideas and be able to navigate sorting through those ideas really well. Ideation isn't something that just one person on the team should be doing. Bring in everyone, bring in different perspectives. There's a huge amount of value in that. Having you know, a diverse team giving ideas and helping contribute to the ideas to shape the game means you've got all of these different perspectives. And that's how you can discover those really unique, really compelling ideas is by getting those different experiences, different inputs on the actual process there. So make sure you're involving everyone in that process. You know, setting aside technical factors is really important. When someone's coming up with ideas in that, avoid and, you know, really try and make sure you're not as soon as someone's like, oh, we, you know, what about, you know, something like of this? Don't, don't adopt an approach like, not too hard, too hard, not doing that, not doing that at all. Don't do something like of that at this stage. At this stage, it's about opening up possibilities and getting all of the different things down because that idea might be out of scope based upon how it was originally pitched or based upon your assumptions of the idea. But that doesn't mean that you can't maybe build something that's part of the way towards that. So noting down those things can be really valuable. So don't be just rejecting an idea because of something like you know, technical factors or that at this stage. You don't want to be doing that. And as I was saying, write everything down. You want to make sure that every bit of ideas, every sort of thought, a bit of inspiration that comes to mind, make sure it's written down. And that way then you've got all of that there to be starting to pull that together. So, okay, we've worked out lots and lots of possible ideas. How do we turn that into something, you know, more concrete? Well, We've got lots of ones. We'll probably have, you know, a few different competing ones. So there's a lot of different ways we can look at this, but there are some key things that are always good to consider at this stage now, now that we've got a few sort of candidate ideas, stuff that we can be thinking of. Player experience is a big thing. 
which of the ideas are really sort of compelling and engaging? Because that's the thing. We want to make something that is engaging. We want to make something that's enjoyable for people to play. So which ideas really have a strong pull in that regard as something that's like, yeah, no, this is the idea of not, not the idea of making it is exciting. The idea of playing it is exciting. It's a big thing. We're making something that we want other people to enjoy. Not to say that the development process shouldn't be enjoyable, but development is work. It, you know, it should be a good environment. It should be enjoyable. But at the end of the day, we're making something that we want others to have fun with. So think about what is, what is going to be enjoyable with the particular games. Think about now at this stage, okay, what are the risks and challenges? What sort of sections of an idea might you know, be, be quite challenging? What might be uh, quite risky from a technical point of view? What might take potentially a uh, you know, unrealistic amount of time? Is there adjustments that could be made to the idea to pare that down? You know, if you've got an idea that it's super, super rock solid and you're like, this is, this is a fantastic idea, but this current plan of it would be too challenging in terms of time or tech risks. Look at, can you implement part of it? Can you simplify it? Feasibility, and this ties into those risks and the time side of things. You know, we want to be confident that we can make something in the time frame possible and in a healthy manner. This is making something without crunching on the project because we want to be avoiding crunch because crunch is bad. Crunch is not something you want to have your yourself, your team, your coworkers, anyone doing. Crunch is not good. So, okay. We could do, for large projects, one of the things you could do is you do actual formal rounds where you pitch an idea, you gather feedback, and then you refine that idea and repitch it. So you could do a few different rounds of that, refining, polishing the ideas. Uh, that's good for those larger, longer projects. Uh, if you don't have sort of that, that's not viable. If it's a really short project, like a 48 hour game jam, something like of that, then as a team, you could start to just do a process of essentially elimination. You know, ones that aren't feasible or too high a risk, knock those out. Or if they if they can be reduced or simplified, do that. But otherwise, those could be eliminated. If there's, you know, as we're saying, we've got this idea, it's like, this is the coolest thing. This is going to be amazing. People are going to love and enjoy playing this. But, oh boy, this tech risk is terrifying. Then, like I was saying, look at this a segment of it. Could we build, you know, the first part of it? Could we build a vertical slice of it? So a small chunk at each stage. Are there parts that we could um, pare back or cut down or shortcut that's going to make it more feasible? That's going to be something we want to consider there. It may not always be possible. But that's something to consider there if you've got this case with like this idea, it's just we don't want to let it go. See if there are ways to make it. There may not be, in which case you might need to let it go for now. You're not letting it go forever. Might just be letting that idea go for now and putting it on the back burner and then you come back to it later. So in general, when we are evaluating these things, we've got to be really thorough and objective. Try and make sure that we're not missing stuff. So be considering things like, okay, how long, you know, the project, what's it going to involve in terms of the various sort of, you know, visual assets, the audio assets, writing, things like that that we might need for it. Think about how complex it might be to test. This is something that's very easily overlooked. Uh, in particular with procedurally generated based games. It's very easy to overlook the testing requirements there. And it's very easy to make a game where it's like, oh yeah, to test all of this. No, we don't have uh, a few trillion years. So that's something where we want to be very mindful of, you know, what's going to be feasible to test and build. So we need to be really objective with that. We need to be really thorough. So, those things that are risks and challenges, they're different for every project. It's not always going to be the same. There's common ones to look for, but they're going to change all of the time. You really, and I can't emphasize this enough, 
focus on what the players will find fun to play. It is very, very easy to get sidetracked of, oh, this is going to be so cool to build. This is going to be so cool to make. And that's great. Like, that's not a bad thing. And that's not something where it's like, no, everything you make has to be boring. Um, it's good for it to be exciting and enjoyable to make it. But the big thing is, the player is the one at the end of the day we want to be having the majority of the fun. If we can be having fun building the stuff, awesome. That's great. And that's a cool thing to have happen. But at the end of the day, making a game is work. There's going to be parts that are exciting, and there are going to be parts that are just work. They're just things that have to be done to get it through to being delivered. So focus on making sure the player is having fun at the end of the day. You know, they're the one that we are creating awesome moments for, and that's really important. Give the player awesome, cool, fantastic moments. Make sure that you are not trying to, you know, cram all of the, uh, you know, okay, we've come up with our ideas and immediately we're now going to take these ideas and polish and refine them and pick the one particular idea of trying to do that in a really concentrated rapid block. In some cases you kind of have a little bit of no choice with something like a game jam but you want to try and have a little bit of space and time there in particular if it's a large project because that's that space that distance from it can be where you can come up with solutions for some of the things where you might have inspiration like oh that thing that was seeming like really difficult the way we're currently thinking there's an easier way we can do that that's going to be as cool or there's this bit from this idea that I think we can bring into this. So having a bit of space there for larger, longer projects in particular is really valuable. So further on, because we're talking about if we're doing pitching and feedback, feedback is a really important thing. And in particular, there's some good approaches for when you were giving feedback to an idea, to a pitch. Uh, in terms of making that feedback constructive and valuable and useful. So big thing and overarching thing there is your feedback is about the content, not the person who delivered the content. So you center it on what the idea is that is being pitched on the execution of that that's being proposed. And a model that you can use for that that works quite well is this model of clarifying questions, warm and cool feedback, and then probing questions. So how that works is clarifying questions are quick ones that have short, simple answers. You know, will this have X? How many of Y will there be? Things where the answer is a few words at most and can be delivered in the moment. They're questions that are used to confirm, to refine your understanding of the idea. So bits that we're un, you're unsure on. Uh, but there should be quick questions, quick answers there. Warm feedback, you want to talk about what you liked about it and why did you like it? That why did you like it? It's really useful to know. Because knowing not just you know knowing that someone likes something, cool, that's awesome. Knowing what about it it was that helps you more to build more of those moments like, oh, well, they really enjoyed this because this was a moment of that, you know, sort of a feeling of wonder. Okay, can we build more moments that generate that feeling of wonder in the game? Can we amp up that feeling of wonder? Cool feedback is what you didn't like about the idea. And again, why? Might be a case of, okay, well, you're not a fan of this because that, feels like it would be quite frustrating and it feels like it would be frustrating because I'd get quite a chunk of the way through it and have to redo all of that because I then, you know, failed. That's useful feedback because it's telling you the particular thing you didn't like, what it was about it that you didn't like, that it caused that frustration and what the source of the frustration was. Again, it's giving actionable, useful feedback. And then the probing side of things, these are long form questions. So these aren't questions that people answer in the moment. These are ones for someone to take that question and then think about it. 
and it's there to prompt, to probe, uh, for sort of thinking deeper about particular areas, for considering areas that might not have been thought of. So this is a really effective method for delivering feedback. Uh, if you're the person receiving feedback, make sure you write all of this stuff down. Don't, you know, one of the worst things you could do is be like, ah, oh, yep, yeah, no, I've got it, got it up here in my head. We all like to think that our memories are better than they actually are. <laughs> so make sure you write down the feedback. Uh, note it down. If possible, record the feedback uh, is even better so that you can hear, you know, be reviewing it through that as well as a great option. So make sure you're keeping track of any of the feedback there. But this is how we get to having a specific idea that we're going to be building. Which then leads us to how do we plan out doing the building of this? So, okay, there's a lot of things we need to work out to plan out a project. We've got to work out all of the pieces. That means audio elements, visual, writing, code, testing, everything, all of these different pieces that are there for it. We need to work out how those pieces look and sound and feel and operate. We need to work out how long we think they'll take. And that should be ballpark estimates. So we want those estimates of how long do we think this is going to actually take. We want to know who's working on each thing. Because that's important to know. Because there's going to be dependencies. And we need to know what those dependencies are. And so who's working on stuff is going to help us be able to structure these different items, the things that need to be made. And we need to know what the risk factors are. And that's on an individual, you know, piece by piece basis, overall stuff for the project as well. We need to know where our risks might be. Because with having all of that information, that then lets us start to work out ordering the pieces. So when we're ordering things, front load your high risk items. I cannot emphasize that enough. Front load high risk items because the high risk ones are the things that can balloon out in time. They're usually the things that our estimates for them are a bit more of a guess. They're a bit more rough. They're ones where things have a higher potential to go wrong and they can sink a project. So it's better to have them happen early where you can switch to a fallback option with enough time still to spare than have them happen towards the end where that can cause, you know, that's how things like crunch and that can potentially happen. So, you know, going, going back to what I've said before, crunch is usually down to incompetent management forcing poor planning um, or poor planning in general. So we want to make sure we've got good planning. So we front load our high risk items. So player experience is also a really good guide for structuring the pieces. So ordering our different milestones based upon, okay, well, what's the player going to be able to do at this one? Cool. What are they going to be able to do at the next one? What are they going to be able to do at the one after that? How are things going to feel? What's going to be the tone and the mood of the game at the different milestones? So you are delivering based upon a progressive, essentially you're progressively improving and expanding the experience for the player milestone to milestone. That's a good way to be approaching it. So that also allows us, we can get feedback at each of them. If we're targeting a particular experience for the player, we can get feedback on that, if whether we're achieving that. Are we succeeding in delivering that? How well are we succeeding in delivering that? What changes should we make? Because we can then fold that feedback in and say, okay, well, we've, you know, there were some issues here. We've tried to improve it for the next one. Have we succeeded in doing that? So really valuable to be building based upon experience. And again, I want to reiterate, we want to make sure we check dependencies. You know, it's very easy to have stuff where it's like, okay, well, if we don't have this system, then we can't, you know, we need this system to be able to make this visual asset and we need this to make this other thing. We want to make sure that we check those dependencies a few times you know, and in particular with the people who are working on those areas to make sure that we have, haven't have missed anything there. Uh, because if something changes, that can then affect other ones. We need to know where the knock-on effect areas are. 
replanning, and I have mentioned this before, because planning isn't something we do once. You don't make your plan and then like, cool, done, no more planning for the rest of the project. Replanning is actually a big part of how we ship something smoothly, calmly, in a way where we can avoid crunch. So in terms of when, you want to have a logical regular interval. So that might be weekly, depends on the length of the project, but you want a fairly regular interval where you're going and doing the replanning. You can also, and you know, I would recommend this, if there's a very major section that's been finished or has run over time by an amount, that is a good point to start replanning as well, to look at, okay, where are the knock-on effects? How can we adjust and compensate for this? So those are good key points to be doing replanning. And a replanning isn't a long process generally, it's pretty quick. We're making sure that our current plan, does it still make sense? There'll be generally large chunks of it that will. If it, there are parts that don't make sense, or there are different things now that are priorities, then we can update the plan based upon that state of the project at the moment. So it's a very relatively quick process, but it's really important to be doing that. It helps ensure that we are heading consistently in the right direction. So some general things. One of the big things when you are planning projects, be wary of underestimating time. If you have multiple people working on the same task, it's very easy to underestimate the amount of time there for it. You know, because we'll often say, okay, yeah, no, there's two people working on this, so we'll halve the time for it that we think it might take. Doesn't necessarily work that way. Depends on how those people work together. Depends upon how much stuff can happen in parallel. So multiple people doesn't necessarily change how long a task takes in the way that you might expect. So we want to be cautious of that. If it's something where people have limited experience with, those can be risk factors as well. Because if it's something where it's like, oh yeah, I've used this before, but you might not have used it in that particular context that you're now needing to use it in. So we can easily underestimate time. There might be things that we miss that's the thing, the really dangerous area is that knowing a little bit about something, but not a lot. Because when you know a little bit, it's very, very easy to underestimate time and things like that, because you think it's often going to be easier than it will be. So be very cautious of that. And <laughs> I'm going to repeat this a few times. We do not want to forget doing testing and feedback. Testing is something that we need to be doing throughout the project. Gathering feedback is something we need to be doing throughout the project. These are not things that we just kick off at the very end. They are how we ship a good game and do so smoothly. That testing and feedback part is just integral to doing that. It's really important. Which leads us to testing and feedback. So in terms of why we need to test, like it's essential. We have to be doing testing. Part of it is the obvious thing that we know of bugs. We're going to make bugs. They're going to happen. It's, that's an unavoidable thing in part of, in development. The complexity and everything that we're working with, there are gonna be bugs and we wanna find them, we wanna fix them. But testing does more than that. It gives us ways to improve the experience. We want our game to be as good as we can make it. And this is how we do it, by testing. And this is a big part of you know, why on a project, you want to make sure you have your quality assurance people there and integrated and working on stuff from the very beginning. You know, your quality assurance people are a key, key essential component of your development team. And I've worked on some projects where we had QA, you know, we, we didn't actually build a QA team until the end. And I've worked on some ones where we had QA from very early on. And having the QA team there from early on and being able to work closely with them as we're building systems just is so valuable and so helpful. And you know, they, they're they able to give such valuable insights into the project. They're doing a lot more than just finding bugs. They're doing a lot of that because we're often making a lot of bugs. Um, I know I certainly was making plenty. Uh, there's a lot of bugs that we're adding in 
but they're also giving us feedback on the experience. And that's something that people often overlook as part of what QA does. They're, they're identifying stuff to improve the experience. So that's why we want to make sure we bring them in early and be getting that feedback and that input from them. They, they are just such a vital part of how we deliver a quality project. So testing, it's essential. Like I was saying, it's, you know, it's, we just don't want to do it right at the end. If we do that, we are setting ourselves up for trouble. It is, and I will reiterate this again, this is why I made it bolded and underlined, it is a core part of building the game. You know, QA are essential members of the development team, so be doing that testing early on you will see the benefit from it. Because they can help guide testing tools as well there, which is really valuable. You can make sure you've got from the beginning when you build a system, you can be like, okay, I need to work out how do we test this? So you can talk with the QA people and work out, okay, what's gonna work as a way of being able to test it? What do they need to test things properly? And you can build that in from the very beginning. It's always a lot easier than bolting stuff in at the end. So that regular feedback, this is, I said, it's just so essential to developing a quality project. So gathering good feedback is also down to asking the right questions. So this is in particular, if we're doing sort of more uh, player focused feedback of getting people to play the game and gathering information from them, we need to ask the right questions to get good feedback. So we wanna make sure the questions are really clear and unambiguous. We wanna avoid things where we're using a lot of jargon or leading questions. Make them clear, simple ones. You know, that's the key thing there. And make them questions that are going to elicit more than just a yes or no response. You know, a question of, did you, did you use X to do Y is, just going to give you generally a response of yes or no. If you asked a question instead of, how did you do Y? They're not going to just tell you, well, I used X generally. You'll often get more information of, oh, I used X and I did this and this and this. So you can ask for more information there. So try to design your questions so you're getting more than just a, a simple yes, no answer generally. You can get more useful information. If you already know the answer to a question, don't ask it. So if you've got telemetry, things like of that for the game, you don't need to ask questions that the telemetry data already tells you. So don't waste people's time with asking questions that you already know the answer to. When you ask any question, think about the kinds of responses that you would get. With those, think about what you would change based upon that. If you ask a question and there is no answer there that would result in you changing anything about the game, why ask the question? What purpose is it serving if you're not actually getting something useful out of it? The idea for getting feedback is to identify things for like, okay, this is, this is working well, here's why it's working well, so we know that we can, you know, amp up and focus and improve that or refine and have more of that, or here is an area that isn't working well, and here's why it's not working well. So we do wanna make sure we consider what are the responses we might get there. That's really important. When we get all of that feedback, there's likely gonna be a lot of it, and that's really hard to navigate because can get huge, huge amounts of it, which is overwhelming. The feedback can also sometimes be negative, and it's going to be. There are gonna be cases where it's like, yep, this is not delivering the experience we wanted. And that can be a, a hard thing to process because they're like, okay, well, this is just all not working. So it can be, that can be really hard to actually navigate. What I recommend for it is Key thing is, don't try and respond on the spot. Take a bit of time, you know, note down feedback if it's being delivered verbally, note it down. Take some time before you then start to try and fix it. Avoid sort of a very reactive approach to it of like, oh, okay, I have to go and fix this right now. Take time, understand the feedback before then looking at changes. 
When you're doing that, review the feedback, categorize it, look for common themes. Are there similar things people are saying about stuff? Are there contradictory things people are saying about stuff? But try and group it into general sort of categories and themes so that you then respond to those. Because you look for the patterns and the common causes and you try and identify solutions that address those rather than addressing, okay, this person said this, so we'll do this fix for this. Look at the broad themes of what's been said. So some general guidance that I recommend with processing feedback. Start your testing and gathering of feedback early. As soon as you've got something where there's any version of the player experience, whether that's mechanics or tone or you know, visual layout, things like of that, start to get that feedback early. That's really valuable. Plan out those questions. You know, as I said, good questions are how you get good feedback and good feedback is something that lets us improve the game. Make sure you're taking the time to review and process that feedback. Don't and avoid those sort of knee-jerk reactions to it. And just because the feedback says, oh, well, you need to add this, or you need to change this, or you need to remove this, doesn't mean that you should. That isn't always going to be the right course. Take the time and think about what the changes are that you need to make. You know, the people giving feedback are not typically going to be designers or develop and new developers in general. So their suggestions are going to tend to be player focused from that mindset. And that means there are going to be you know systems and aspects of the game they're not familiar with. So there may be ways of solving the problem that they may not be aware of. There may be things that are not happening that should be that they're not aware of. So take the time to consider the changes. Shouldn't necessarily just be an automatic thing if well, they said add this, so add this. Think about what stuff is going to be appropriate to change and add there. That brings us now to the delivery phase for the project. So delivering a project. What we have to do there is going to vary a bit project to project. But it might be, you know, in general, we're going to have things like we have to bring our build to a shippable level of performance and stability to something that is running well on all of our target devices and is not crashing, things like of that, that it's working well, that we have a solid, stable, performant game. It's often going to include things like there might be, you know, setting up up-to-date promotional materials because the visual appearance of the game will generally change throughout. So getting updated materials there is a common component for this. There'll be the process of uploading builds and then please make sure you test things like your distribution mechanisms. There might be also testing things like server interfaces, stuff like of that. So making sure all of those are absolutely working. You'd be testing those throughout but you want to be doing sort of further final testing with those with updated builds. Delivering a project is actually often a really challenging thing because you can see that finish line. And there's something that seems to always happen there that as soon as you're able to see that finish line, as soon as you're past that point where you're like, oh, we've got most of this project done, motivation can be really difficult at that point. That often tends to happen. So recognize that that might happen and be prepared for that. So how we go about this, again, planning. We want to make sure that we have a solid set of here are all of the remaining tasks to deliver that project. And knowing how long those will take, we chuck in a buffer that gives us our delivery date. So we know the date that we're going to be able to hit. We want to be, Ken, continuing to be doing our replanning. And we want to make sure we're keeping an eye out for easy to miss things because it's very possible to have missed stuff. And this is something where this is a stage where that's crucial to make sure we don't miss things. So again, getting multiple eyes on stuff to make sure we're not missing something. You want to be very cautious about what stuff you change or add at this point. Once you're in that delivery phase, you know, this would be things like, oh, cool, we're going to change to a completely new major update of the game engine. May not be the best time. 
And you want to be really cautious of whether that is going to be a wise thing to do or not. Is the benefit going to outweigh the risk for that? So evaluate the risks carefully. And if it's high risk, make sure it's worth it and make sure you have a backup plan for it if it doesn't pan out. So in general with delivery, as I said, you want to be mindful of hitting that it's almost done point. It is something where motivation tanks quite commonly there and it's it's something to be aware of and you can get navigate through that but it is something that it's good to be aware that you're going to hit into that you have to and this is one of the things that is challenging because of the, that impact of being really thorough you want to make sure you're going through and just forcing yourself to be very thorough like yep have we covered every one of the different things necessary there for delivery if you've missed something make sure it gets factored into the plan immediately it's also a thing of as soon as you deliver a project post project depression is not an uncommon thing it's something a lot of devs will experience that if you have delivered the project it's all done and then just mood crashes and that's you know a, a thing to plan for you, know, you need to take breaks to recover things like of that but be mindful that you know, if that happens it is actually quite a common thing with projects and the longer larger a project it is the more likely that is you you are to experience that but even on smaller projects you can experience that of like well you've had this really intense moment you've created all this cool stuff and now it's over so be mindful of that impact that can happen at that point so have that time for recovering resting is really important Thanks folks, I hope you found the video helpful. If you've got any questions, chuck in a comment below. Always happy to answer any questions you've got there. If you did find the video helpful, chuck in a like and subscribe. Really helps out, really appreciated. And if you're looking for other ways to support the channel, then I do have a Patreon and you'll see the link to that's in the description below as well. But until next time, bye.